So the probability of two events co-occurring if those events are independent is the probability of each event by itself multiplied. Okay? This usually gives you a smaller probability. The intuition here is that, say for example, X is being sick and Y is, say, dropping your wallet on the street. Well, the probability of you dropping your wallet on the street right, is low. Now, the probability of you being sick is, you know, let's say, also fairly low. Now, the probability that as you're sick, you're dropping your wallet on the street is lower than both those probabilities, right? That's why it's, that's the intuition, right? And that makes sense because the multiplication of two numbers that are equal or less than one will be equal or much less than one. So here, here's an example. The probability of drawing an ace from one deck of cards and an ace from another deck of cards. So you have two decks of cards. You take one card out of each deck. What's the probability that you get aces both times? That's the probability that the first is an ace from deck A and the second card is an ace from deck B. Well, it'll be the probability of getting an ace from deck A, which is 4 over 52 because there's four cards over 52 cards times the probability of getting a deck from deck uh, an ace from deck B, which is 4 over 52, because there are 4 aces and 52 cards. Now, the probability of drawing two aces consecutively from, deck, from a deck of cards, that is, drawing aces from only one deck of cards, right? That is a different question. Here, the question would be, once I drew an ace, so the probability of drawing the first ace here, right, will be 4 over 52 because there's 4 aces over 52 cards. However, if I draw an ace from this card, from this deck, and then I try to draw another ace, well, I will only have 3 aces left and 51 cards. So this multiplication is a little bit different, okay? The way to think about it is, is what's the probability of getting here, what's the probability of getting, you know, two aces, right? Two aces, given that I already got the first ace, right? That would be 3 over 51. That's, that's that probability, right? So if these two events, x and y, are dependent on each other, so getting an ace from a deck of cards and then getting another ace from the same deck of cards are dependent, because the second time you draw really depends on what happens the first time. It's the probability of the first event... 4 over 52, times something called the conditional probability. So what's the probability of the second event given what happened with the, th with the first event? And that would be this probability. And so we start our journey to conditional probabilities. Now, here's a little example to, to exemplify this joint probabilities and uh, conditional probabilities. Suppose we have a bag with four balls, three red and one blue. So red, 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 blue. Okay. The event of drawing a ball is B. Let's call B is the drawing of a ball. B1 is drawing a first ball. B2 is drawing a second ball. So what's the probability that the first ball is red? And what's the probability that the second ball, uh, that the first ball is blue? Well, the probability that the first ball is red is three, one, two, three, out of four balls, right? So it'd be 3 over 4. The probability that it's blue is 1 over 4, because there's only one blue ball out of the 4 in the bag. Now, let's think about drawing two balls. Draw one ball first, and another, uh, drawing one ball first, B1, and then drawing a second ball given the color that you drew on the first try. So what is the probability that if you drew a red ball on the first drawing, what's the probability that you will uh, draw a red ball on the second drawing, right? So let's say you drew a red ball on the first drawing, and now you're left with three balls, two of which are red. So this would be here two-thirds. What is the probability that uh, of drawing uh, a blue ball given that you've drawn a red ball in the first try? Well, it'd be one over three and so on and so forth. So the probability of drawing a, a blue ball first and then a red ball. What's the probability of drawing a red ball given that you've already drawn a blue ball, right? Well, it's one because if you drew a, a blue ball on the first try, right, then you're only left with red balls, 
right? There are no blue balls. So this is the notation for conditional probabilities, and it's read as like this. What's the probability of B2 given what happened here in B1, given B1? Now, contrast that to uh, joint probabilities. Here, joint probabilities would be, so this is what's the probability of getting the second ball given what happened with the first one, right? The joint probability is what's the probability of getting ball one with a collar and ball two with another collar, okay? Again, this just like the aces, right? Just like in the case of, of the aces here, it's the difference between thinking of this as independent events, right? And thinking of this as dependent events. In this case, the events are dependent. So you have to multiply the probability of the first one times the conditional probability of the second one. So let's look at that. What's the probability of drawing a red ball first and a red ball sec uh, two red balls, right? Remember here, I'm saying what's the probability of drawing a red ball if I know that I drew a red ball in the first place? Here, the question is what is the probability of drawing two red balls consecutively is different. Here, I don't know what the two balls are going to be. Here, I know what the first draw was. So, of drawing two balls consecutive, two red balls consecutively, well, the probability of drawing a red ball in the first place is one over four. I mean, three over four. There's three red balls out of four balls. Three over four. And the probability of drawing a red ball after I drew a first red ball is like we have here, two over three. Now, you, you multiply three over four times two over three, and you get one half. In the same way, what's the probability of getting a red ball and a blue ball? You'll see that it's one-fourth, uh, because the probability of getting a red ball in the first place, which is three over, two, uh, uh, three over four, times the probability of getting a blue ball after you got the red ball, which is one over three. Okay, that gives you one over four. And so on and so forth. You can compute these probabilities and, and prove that they're, that they're the same. Now, with conditional probabilities comes something else. Some things that we can do to conditional probabilities. So what I'm going to do now is, let's say we have some data, and we're going to look at joint probability distributions and conditional probabilities. So let's assume that drink, your level of drinking, whether you're past the legal level or not, let's say that that influences your driving style, and it also, and also the conditions of the road influence the way you drive. Okay, so we have these three factors. Drink, style, and road. And I've created a legal ta uh, 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 little table here, right, to represent this. Now, we know that drink can be legal levels or illegal levels. We know that the road can be either dry or wet. And we know that your style of driving can be judged into excellent, fair, or reckless. So with this data, I observe a lot of people driving and I, you know, give them a test and I know the level that they've been drinking and so on and so forth. And I realize this. People who are drinking, who have drunk at the legal level, when the road is dry and are driving excellently, the probability of that happening in my data was 0.11. So out of all the people that I surveyed, 0.11 of them were driving excellently on a dry road with legal levels of uh, drink in their blood. So I started building this, this table, right? So for example, here, people drinking with illegal levels of drink in their blood, when the, is, when the road was dry and they were driving excellently, that was only 8% of my data, and so on and so forth. So this is what this represents. Now, because these are probabilities and these are basically percentages that I found in my data, all these probabilities, if you add them up, they will sum up to one. And we say that this table here is the joint probability distribution of drink, road, and style, of the variables, the random variables. Now, what we can do sometimes, with this we can ask a lot of questions. So we can ask, for example, what's the probability of having um, uh, legal levels of, of alcohol in the blood when the road conditions are wet? What's the probability of somebody uh, driving excellently? Well, we look at legal wet, 
excellent, and we'll find the probability of that happening is 8%, 0.08. So we can ask a lot of questions about these variables and their probabilities. Now, we can also ask slightly more interesting questions if we condition something. So let's say we know the road is dry. I'm going to ask questions, and I'm assuming the road is dry for all these questions. So for example, what is the probability of, um, of uh, le uh, having legally drunk with uh, regular style when the road is dry, right? So what I'm really asking is, what's the probability of the variables drink and style given that the road is dry? That's, that's what I'm going to do. Well, what I do for that is I only select the rows where the, where the, um, I only select the data where the road is dry. And I remove the data where the road is not dry. However, importantly, if you add these probabilities, you realize that they do not sum up to 1. Actually, I believe they sum up to 0.68. So what we need to do now is that these are not going to be probabilities. So what we need to do is to normalize. Whenever we want to know the probability of drink style given the road, in this case dry, what we need to do is to get whatever number we have, the Q, because these are not probabilities anymore, so I'm going to call it Q. The number that, with the, that corresponds to the drink and style when the road is dry that you want to know divided by the sum over all drink and style of driving uh, numbers when the road is dry. So in this case, for example, if I want to know, well, what's the probability of, um, for example, of, of driving recklessly while having legal levels of drink, given that the road is dry, what I will do is something like this. I will do, um, I will put here something like this, something like this, whoops, sorry. I will put here something, something like this. I will say probability of legal, right, and driving recklessly given dry, given that the road is dry, right, that will be the number that I find with legal, reckless, and dry, which is 0 0.05, 0 point, point, whoops, 0 0.05, pardon my slow writing, 0 0.05 divided by, and then I add up all these numbers, right? All these numbers, 0 0.11, plus 0 0.23, plus 0 0.05, plus 0 0.08, plus 0 0.08, plus 0 0.13, which gives me 0 0.68. And this division, this division is the actual probability. This 0 0.68, or the sum over all driving, uh, driving uh, drinking levels and driving styles when the road is dry, this is called the normalization constant. Okay, so this 0 0.68 will be a normalization constant. If you normalize each of these probabilities, then they will add up to 1. Now, for you at home, try to compute the probability of legal, reckless, and dry. So do the division. Now, another operation, another question that we can answer is, for example, well, I don't care about, um, I don't care about style, right? I just want to know what's the probability that you're drinking legally when the road is dry, period, right? So this is our original table. I just want to know what ha what's the probability of le drinking legally when the road is dry. Well, drinking legally when the road is dry happens in all these cases, right? So what you do here is you eliminate the variable style and add up all the instances where you find, in this case, legal and dry, legal and wet, illegal and dry, illegal and wet. Basically, you add here, you add all the instances of drink and road where, and where the style is something fixed for all the for all 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 the styles, 
in this case style goes from um, uh, 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 reckless, fair, and excellent, right? That's how you compute these probabilities. Now, because it's just a sum, you're aggregating, they will still add up to one. And then if you wonder, what's the probability of of, um, of drink and road? Let's say, what's the probability of legal, of, uh, legal levels of drinking when the road is wet? When well, just just have it. It's 19%. This is called marginalization. When we keep one one uh, variable with a set value that's called conditioning. So conditioning and marginalization are very important in probabilities. Now, to finish uh, conditional probabilities, it's important to talk about conditional independence. The formal definition is x, some random variable, is conditionally independent of another random variable y given z if the probability distribution that governs x is independent of the value of y given the value of z, okay? That is the probability of one variable given two others is conditionally independent of one of these, say y, right? Therefore, this variable only depends on z. So, and this is a compact way of writing it. Now, let's, let's look at an example. Let's say, for example, I have, I can determine the precedent, there's, there's a probability associated to the precedent of a country given the food that he or she eats and the nationality of the person, right? So for example, here, uh, for example, if the meal is tacos, well, there's a probability that this is the precedent of Mexico, right? And there's a probability also for the nationality, right? There's a probability, so say the nationality, if the president liked tacos, the nationality might be, there's a 80% Mexican, 20% uh, United States, for example, okay? So we have a joint probability distribution of precedent nationality and meal. However, if I know the nationality, right? So if, for example, somebody tells me the nationality is Mexican, then meal becomes irrelevant. I don't need to know the meal. I already know it's the president of Mexico, right? Because the nationality, right? Because precedent is conditionally independent of meal given nationality. Okay? So... If I know nationality, I don't need meal at all, right? That, that, that's what conditional independence means. Another example that's uh, uh, many times given is this one. Thunder is conditionally independent of rain given lightning. So for example, if it's rain, raining, there's uh, some chance of lightning, some chance of rain, well, there's some chance of thunder, right? So these three I can observe when there's rain, lightning, and thunder and I will have a joint probability distribution. However, if you tell me that there's lightning, I really don't need rain. I don't care about the rain, because if there's lightning, thunder is a, is a, is a, is a side effect of, or lightning is a side effect of thunder. So, um, so these two are related. So if I know that there's lightning, right, I don't need to know whether there's rain or not. So in this case, thunder is conditionally independent of rain, given lightning. And we can say that there's a probability of thunder given lightning, right? If, the, if you see lightning, there's a probability that you'll hear a thunder. Rain doesn't have anything to do with that, right? So that is conditional independence. Um, our next unit will cover based, uh, Bayesian uh, theorem.